Can you imagine this? We're at the last meeting already. It's kind of hard to believe in a way, isn't it? But time keeps marching on. And for this last meeting tonight, we want to say welcome to our, it's hard to look at that light up there, but welcome to our live stream friends and viewers. And welcome to all of you. It's been a long day, but it's been a blessed day, hasn't it? Amen. Have you been inspired? Have you been encouraged? Have you been challenged? So have we. <laughs> We're right here with you. And the question that we ask tonight, why not? Why not? Why not meet every supposed impossibility in the strength of Jesus Christ? Why not? Amen. You know, I believe, and I, I was talking to my dear wife here, I believe that before we leave here, and maybe for some of us, between now and the next week, we will have one of two ways of looking at this question, why not? We will leave here believing, maybe like we've never believed before, that the God that we have professed to serve is really the God of all flesh. He is really the God that can change our lives and that nothing will stand in our way as we go forward in the strength of Jesus Christ. Or we will leave here already saying, why not? I'll tell you why not. Because she's not going to change. She's the one. Or he's Always this way at camp meeting, but when we go home, retreat, <laughs> you hear me go all the way back to camp meeting. <laughs> it's just tough to change names here. He, he always acts this way at retreat, but we won't even get home before he's back in his old character. That's why not. I hope that we won't go there. I hope that we won't go there because our perspective, not God's, but our perspective becomes our reality. And if our perspective leaves here with we can do the impossible with God, we will be able to do the impossible with God. Do you believe it? Amen. But if we leave here already defeated, sometimes we'll be talking with a couple. We've talked to lots of couples over the last 26 years, and, and, and oftentimes, because we're creatures of habit, we'll be talking, and we will be thrilled to see the breakthroughs that God is doing with a couple who is willing to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Amen. Christ. It's, I mean, sometimes it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. But quite often, near the end of communicating together with a couple who is excited, sometimes in tears with enthusiasm and desire to change, one or the other or both of them will say, but I don't know if I have much hope of seeing him change. Oh, that's just like a kind of a blow to the, to the whole spirit of the atmosphere. Because when that comes back in, the perception of the change changes. Mm -hmm. We go from hope, we go from yes, we can be different to slipping back into the old ways. And, we don't need to slip back into our old ways. We don't want to have a message this evening that is just a preachy message. We want this message to really reach every one of our hearts, ours included, that we make a decision here this evening, right now, while we're seated, or for us, while we're standing. 
Because if we don't, if we wait till a more convenient season, we lose our motivation. We forget the inspiration. And we go out of here thinking, yes, when we get home, we'll, we'll you know, get settled in and then we'll start, you know, making this difference or that difference. If we don't decided here what our plan is when we leave here, chances are when we get where we're going, we will be no different than when we came. And then what have we had for the last five days? Good fellowship, inspiring messages, delicious food, hopefully good sleep, and it may be a nice getaway from the routine and pressures of daily life. But friends, it's time that we go away with more than just that. Don't you agree? Amen. It's time that we go away with a desire, a motivation, a belief, a conviction, a drive that with God all things are possible, even my own stubbornness. And sometimes we don't even look at the other person. Sometimes we, we convince ourselves that we just can't do it. We're our own worst enemy. We cooperate too easily with the devil. We can do all things through Christ. There is nothing too hard for him. And if we link our weakness with his strength, then we are fully capable of becoming anyone that he wants us to be. We can become anything he wants us to be. We can do anything he wants us to do. How do you like that? That's limitless, isn't it? Because we're with God and with God, he takes us on that journey. He promises to go all the way home with us. And that's what we want. And, and I want to just touch again on this idea of, of our perception. Because it is our perception that shapes our reality, that shapes our commitment, that shapes our perseverance. And there's an example in the Bible that, that most of us know, a very simple but powerful example that talks about perception. And that is the experience when Elisha is out there and he's surrounded by the Syrians. And what does Elisha see? All these Syrian chariots, but what does he see? He sees the angels of God encircling him. And his poor servant, who has his perception, sees only the chariots of the Syrian. Because the perception of Elisha's servant was not perceiving with the faith that Elisha was perceiving with. And so Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. Amen. What a change. Let's ask God to open our eyes before we leave this place. Amen. Oh God, open our eyes that we might see with the eyes of faith and perceive a new reality for our Christian experience. We need it. Mm -hmm. We desperately need it or we are destined to plateau, and that plateau begins to drop off. You want a new perception of God's reality? Do you want that? Amen. I hope we want that. We need that. And God wants to give it to us. So I hope that we will all be open to what God's been speaking to our hearts and that we will be willing to walk out of here with a perception of faith. Why not? What has God not done for us to give us the perception of faith that he can continue to do this work in us? And children, I hope that you're not thinking that this is just for the big people in the room. This Amen. is for everyone who has the ability to hear and understand, whether you're three or four, maybe even two, you know what is right. You know when mommy asks you to do something, and that is the time that God wants to be real in your life when you don't feel like it. So we're talking to everybody in this room tonight, not just your mommies and daddies, okay? We're talking to youth here in the room. You are under different kind of temptations than maybe your dad or your mom or your grandma or whoever it is. God has a plan for every life. 
God is one who makes no mistakes. And even though your circumstances may seem trying, difficult, uh, unpleasant, whatever it may be, God is going to take you through that. And if you go through that with God, you're going to come out, going to come through that out the other side. And you're going to come out with joy, peace and, and happiness that you have gone through the trials that you face with the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you here tonight know the name Nick Vujicic? How many people? Okay. That's pretty good. I, I thought at least half of you would know his situation. No arms, no legs, no worries. <laughs> you know that no worries, that comes from our Aussie friends, okay? So, how can someone with no arms and no legs have no worries? It's because this young man, Nick, for those of you that don't know about Nick, he was born with no arms and no legs, a very unusual anomaly, it wasn't genetic. And so he faced for years the challenges physically, but more so emotionally, the challenges of being an oddity. You know, like the kind of like the circus in the old days where they had the, the freak shows and things, the people that had malformations. Well, they don't do that so much nowadays, but that's what happens in the schools. That's what happens with the cruelty. You know, young people sometimes can be very cruel because they just say whatever they think. And when Nick was eight years old, he went through a day, and some of you have heard his testimony, he went through a day where everybody seemed to be saying things that were hurtful to him. And he had done so well for so long, and he finally came to the place that he said, if one more person says a mean thing to me, I'm going to kill myself. Why, why should I live? Why, why should I live like this if this is the way my life is going to be? And so not only is he struggling with no arms and no legs, but he's struggling that nobody really wants to accept him. And so on his way home that day from school, a young girl called out to him and he winces, thinking here it is. But she didn't say something mean to him. She told him that she liked his smile. She told him something nice about him. And you know, that little girl didn't know that that changed the destiny of his life that day. Now I bring that part of the story up because sometimes we become so self-focused, so me-focused, so into ourselves that we only think of how bad we are and we aren't thinking about the impact that we're having on other people's lives. That's just another perspective on this. But that was, that was a, a turn in, in that young man's life. And he does some amazing things today because his perception of his reality has not limited him to what people said he could do and could not do. What's some of the things that Nick does today? Well, he was determined he would not be confined to a wheelchair. And he's, his testimony is, I know he, his maker, is with me. Amen. God makes no mistakes. God had a purpose for Nick's life like this. And so this young man, now in his late, he's probably in his early 30s by now. This young man, as a boy, was be able to learn and do things that normal children can do, like ride a skateboard. But he doesn't have any arms, he doesn't have any legs, but he can sure twist his hips pretty good. And he has a little flapper, as he calls it, like kind of a half a foot on one side. <laughs> Wasn't God merciful? That's all that he needed to be able to maneuver incredibly. This young man learned to swim. Now, 
That's phenomenal to me, because I have two arms and two legs, and I am a terrible swimmer. <laughs> and then to think he could get himself out of the swimming pool. You think about it, you're in the pool, right? How do you get out? You, you swim over to the edge, and you grab a hold of the bars, right? And you raise your foot, and you put it on the, the step, and you climb out. Well, he can't do that. Or if you, you're strong enough, you can come to the side, and you can you know, push on the edge and make yourself go down and jump up. He has no arms but he can get himself in and out of the pool. And you can go online and listen to the story, but it is, it's hilarious, but it is also very, ve touching. very touching and very uh, sobering to realize that he would not let defeat be part of his life. And that's what each of us need, not to let defeat be a part of our life. The only thing we want to defeat is sin. Anything else? needs to be, by the grace of God, through his power, we can conquer it. And the most beautiful part of his story is that he had a hope and a dream that someday he would be married and have a family. Now you picture this. You have a body, you have a trunk and a head, and that's what you have. Can you visualize it for those of you who haven't seen his picture, right? You've got a trunk and a head, and he wants to be a married man with a family. And God has given him a beautiful wife who loves him and a beautiful child. And so why are we so afraid? Why are we so limited for what God's plan is for our life? Because if God can do that with someone with no arms and no legs, what can he do with your life and my life? I love this text that goes so beautifully with what Nick has experienced and what we can experience. Jeremiah 32, 17, I even like the way that, that Jeremiah puts it down. Ah, Lord God. Can you hear that? He didn't just say Lord God, he said, ah, Lord God. Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, God's stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. So we all believe that there's nothing too hard for God. Then I ask the question again, why not? Why not have what God wants to give us? Why not receive life eternal? Why not open the door for Jesus when he's knocking and doesn't push the door open? We want to talk for a little while about kind of capsulizing the three areas that we've discussed as a ministry team over this past few days, beginning with the personal. And the question is, will I, and you are all with us asking this question, will I in the personal walk, in my personal profession of Christianity, will I, really give God full access to my life? Will I? Why not? You know, I said to Elaine before we came over here, you know, somehow by God's grace, we, we've got to make this common sense. We've got to make this, we try to make every message practical, we've got to make this so common sense that we, we can't, none of us can miss it. Why should we say we are Christians? Why should we say we serve the living God? Why should we say, I want to do his will? Why should we say all these things and then say, I don't want him to have full access to my life? And, and that's what we've been talking about in several of the messages. 
making God a real part of our lives. When we talked to that first message about the skeletons in the closet, why not let God open the door and clean us up, right? I mean, why do we want to hide all this stuff? Why do we want to cherish all this stuff that is for our demise? Will we, will I, will you be willing to let God do his work in our hearts? Why not? I mean, it seems sometimes a little bit scary, but once we just make that choice that has been very clear, it's our part to do, right? It was very clear at the 11 o'clock hour. Our part is to make the choice to step on the side of Christ. And when we step onto his side, he empowers us to do whatever it is he wants us to do to give up whatever he wants us to give up, to go wherever he wants us to go, to love the way he would love those around us. Our husband, our, our wife, our children, our neighbor, our church members. Why not let God have full access? So this first area that we're talking about on the individual, personal side of this, why not? If we do not make these decisions, if we, won't, if we won't go there, then it won't work in the rest of what we're going to talk about. That's right. It's that simple. It won't work in the marriage. We can, it's not going to work in the family. It's not going to work with our parenting because it starts right here. And, and Hannah talked about doing all this for love. Whatever it is that we're doing as Christians, we're doing it for love. We, we need to have time to let God ravish us with his love. Amen. That's a very elaborate word. <laughs> let him ravish us with his love. That means let us be willing to allow that process to happen because he loves us with an everlasting love. Amen. And he is constantly drawing us. That's what he's doing. Amen. Constantly. He's doing it right now. Why not let him have access to us? Why not take the time morning by morning, day by day to enter in more and more deeply with that relationship? And I have a taste of that in my marriage. I love being with this girl, and she knows that, and I, I just, I can't get enough of her, and I love that. <laughs> there is nothing arduous about my wanting to be with my wife, nothing arduous about it. I love being with her, and I do not like being apart from her. I want that with God. Amen. But it won't happen by accident, friends. We need to let God have access to us. That means we need to make time for him to respond to his love because everything good that happens happens because of God. Every response we have is a gift from God. Every good gift comes from God, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. We need to respond to that love. And when we experience that love, we respond to that love with love. It's love that motivates us for the change. That it's not a problem, it's not a hassle, it's not a duty, it's not you know, a difficulty, but we, we change because our, our hearts are touched by his love and our response is we want to love him back with our life. Therefore, it's not you know, trying to say, no, I don't wanna eat that, I know, and facing the temptation, it's like, no, I don't want that. I want you, Lord. I want you, God. I do this because I love you. You have given everything for me, and you've asked so little from me. We should give whatever little he asks of us and give it back freely. Let's love him in response to his love. And that's where Paul left us at the 11 o'clock hour with the choice the only choice that makes the most difference, okay? There's nothing we can do to make God's love any bigger or better than it is. 
There's nothing we can do to contribute to the transforming power of God, but there's one thing we can do to make it ours. And that is we make a choice. And choice by choice, we become transformed by grace. And the impossibilities become possible with our great God and the choices we make with him and for him. So now we want to look at the age of marriage. And there was a couple of topics that we shared this past week on marriage. So why not make our marriages all they can be? Don't you want a happy marriage? Let me see the hands of those of you who are married. Okay. And, if, and if you want them to, to be happy, keep your hands up. Keep them up. Okay. All right. Looks like we're all agreed, right? Then we have a part to play in that. It's, it's something God wants us to invest ourselves in. It's a two-way relationship. And I'll never change my husband. He will never change me. But God's love working through him and God's love working through me and God's love working to, with us together can do the impossible. It can bring us in such a beautiful, loving relationship. So we talked first about the malfunctions that we have in our marriages. These patterns, these cycles, when this goes wrong, how we, we have misconceptions and we have misconduct and we have um, misunderstandings and miscommunications. And we start with something small and it gets very big, very ugly, very fast, and it causes division and it causes pain and hurt. God wants to change all that. Amen. He wants to, to get us right back in the beginning of the situation and he wants us to learn how to communicate through it so that it doesn't separate us, so that it doesn't divide us, so that it doesn't cause us to go our different directions. And when we are willing to cooperate with God and listen and respond to him and to our spouse, it is an amazing thing that you can go through some really challenging things and they not really feel challenging at all. It's almost fun to go through them because you see how powerful our God is, who's the God of the impossibility. And some of them aren't very fun at all. Okay? <laughs> but the exciting part. Yes. And I also told my wife this. I said, I don't know what it is, you know, but I'm really excited about this because I'm seeing some of these things in a different That's way. Right. And I'm excited because it makes sense to me. I say I love my wife and, and I love her as much as I know how to love her. But I'm excited that any of the patterns of malfunction that we have experienced that will come back to test us, I know God wants to take us completely through them. That's right. And I'm excited Every about time, that. Every time, not just some of the time. That's right. Ultimately, completely victorious in the strength of Jesus Christ. Does that excite you? Amen. Good. Didn't sound real excited, but, but it was a response. <laughs> I know that God is not through with any of us. That's right. And he wants to make our marriages unimaginably beautiful and loving and intimate and reflective of love. You want that? That's something to get excited about. That's right. So, giving my wife permission right here in front of all of you. This is not in the notes. <laughs> Honey, I'm giving you permission. Okay, I'm listening very carefully to remind me how exciting this is going to be I will. when my self is crossed. Okay. Is that clear? That's very clear. Did all of you hear that? <laughs> and, you, and you have permission to tell them on me <laughs> if I don't do well. If I do well, you can tell them that too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll go in the contract with you. You will? I will. So it's going to so be both ways. You hold us accountable, okay? That was definitely not in our that's notes. Right. That was spontaneous, but that's how excited. Hope it's not just emotional no, enthusiasm. No, because it's okay. how God is working in our hearts. It because is. Because we don't want to be the people, you know, at next retreat, which is in, what, three weeks from now, we'll be in the UK. We don't want to be the same people we are here today. Amen. We want to be just more and more and more like Christ. 
more and more in love in our marriage, more and more unselfish. Paul and Carolyn shared me and my marriage, and they were talking about the only problem with our marriages is they have me in it. It's a serious problem. It is a serious problem because self is there. You can't take the me's out. I mean, you can't take the human beings out. We've got to get the me's out. We need to put God in the me's and make, make us an us. Make us surrendered, loving, willing, helping one another, forbearing one another, loving one another. Yes. Yes. That forbearing is a good word. <laughs> the bottom line with the me problem that Paul and Carolyn were talking about last night, the bottom line is that we are more in love with me by, na by natural that's self, mm -hmm. the natural me. That's the natural selfishness. We, when it comes down to it, too many times we are more in love with me than we are with God and her. Because me is who we've lived with for so long and become so selfish. And when you bring that into the marriage, you have two problems if you've got two me's. And they brought that out last night. And the bottom line is for us is that an uncontrolled self, that's the me who says no to God when that still small voice prompts me, who goes ahead and gets irritated, that uncontrolled self. And you hear how quiet it gets in here? Everybody knows what we're talking about. That uncontrolled self stops all the progress of living happily ever after. It stops what it means that the two shall become one. It stops it. I don't want to keep stopping that on the road to heaven. Do you? No. I don't want an uncontrollable me stopping the progress that God is trying to do in this marriage. We can choose the possible That's right. with Christ and move aside from what seems impossible. So shall we make another? Well, at least I will. Well, go, go for it. Okay. I'll probably be right there with you. Okay. So when shall the, we write these down? Yeah, take notes for us. We don't have a pen, okay? You can give it to us afterwards. Go ahead. So when, when the me over here gets very mead. Okay. Gets, gets very me. Yeah, mead. <laughs> In other words, me's living over here. Okay. And it shouldn't be a me. So you'll have, you'll say, honey, knees up. Knees up? Yeah, knees up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> say it in, in good English. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought of Jack Rain when you said that. Okay. Knees <laughs> up. <laughs> no. You have permission to Smashed say. Smash me thumb. <laughs> yeah. You have permission to say, honey, yourself is stopping progress. How's that? You're going to actually give me permission I am, publicly I am, to do that? I am. I am. <laughs> It's a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I need it. Believe and, me, I and, need help. And I, and I reciprocate that. Okay. Okay? You didn't have to because I said that. No, I, okay. I wanted to. Because we want to be different. What we are almost pleading with you to do, we want more of for us. More love. That's why we're saying it. Mm -hmm. Okay? More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. We need that love. We need his love. We need his power. We need his possibilities working in our impossibilities. Okay. Parenting and family. We're going to talk a little bit about that because if we're willing to let God deal with us individually, if we're willing to let him deal with us as a couple, we will be willing to let him deal with us as parents, right? That's, we, we say we want our children ready for the kingdom of heaven. We want to see them receive the crown of life. Then we are going to be willing to take the third step. That's right. And that is that we will, why not? <laughs> no reason why not. His grace is sufficient. That's right. We are going to be willing to let him have access to our parenting That's right. and our family life. Mm -hmm. And I think Carolyn did a beautiful job of hitting five powerful points on parenting. And when you think about it, we're just gonna highlight one, 
It's usually the one that most parents don't like to hear, but I mean, we don't mind hearing it, but it's just a real tough one to really do. But if we address this one issue, it will change powerfully the outcome in our families. It'll bring so much more contentment, joy, happiness, working together. It's, it's, it's truly a blessing, and that is the area of schedule. The entire world works off a of schedule, and it operates fairly smoothly, doesn't it? Hmm. We, our lives are constantly influenced by our work, you know, our, our church going. Everything we do is operated around a schedule, schedule except our homes. And that's why we have so much crisis and conflict in the home. And chaos. And chaos. So why not take that one point and the others as well, but really say, I don't want to continue living like this. I don't want to continue having chaos in my home. I don't want to have the, the contention and the, the frustration and the, the conflict there. We can make a change. When we go home, even though we have no children, we still live on a schedule. It doesn't matter what time we get in at night. It doesn't matter if we've flown home from Australia. We've had been up most of the night, half the day, driving home, getting home at 7 o'clock at night after leaving the day before in Australia. When we go to bed the next morning, we get up and we are still having breakfast and worship at our normal time. Because if we don't, we find that our lives get turned around, upside down. And that might sound, you know, I was just listening to you okay. say that, to, that might sound to these, some of these people like that is a little bit fanatical, okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean, I just want to yeah. soften that a little bit. It, what she said is true. It's more because it's the habit that we've developed. But I can tell you that if we just crash, that's okay. And we do, occasionally. Yeah, but we never crash past 7.30 in the morning. It's true. That's, <laughs> That's no true. No matter what time we go to bed, we're still awake by 7 o'clock or 7.30 yeah, in the morning. Certainly morning. you are, okay? Oh, well, you are too these yes, days. Yes, I am. Not because, because of me it's, but, but it's because of the regularity and because of the habits. Yes. But it doesn't mean, because sometimes people will say to us, so how long does it take you to recover from family retreat when you get home? And we say, well, we're back up we, uh, on family worship with her mother lives with us now full time. We're back up having family worship right on schedule. Oh, it takes me three or four days, sometimes even a week to get back on schedule. Well, we can't afford to do that because many we times we go home and we're back out on the road again in three days. So part of it is because we've had to have the discipline, but it perfectly illustrates mm -hmm what Elaine's saying here, everything in our lives runs on a schedule. How would you like it if you're over in Europe and you get on the train? I love the European rail system because when it's 8 o'clock and the schedule says they leave at 8 o'clock, boom, the doors go shut and the train is going. If you're not on it, sorry. I love that because you can count on it. You know, how would you like it if the world ran like our homes sometimes run and, you know, you get to the church and, uh, well, you know, no deacon showed up this Sabbath. The doors aren't even unlocked and it's 930. That would be a bit shocking, wouldn't it? We wouldn't like that. We wouldn't like going to the bank and finding out that, well, the hours say they're open from 8 to 5, but we get there and... They say, sorry, we all slept in today and, you know, the bank's not going to open for another hour because we're behind. We wouldn't tolerate it. And we don't want to tolerate that in our families. And so schedule and regularity, even though it's a subject that many people don't like, we do it in every other part of life and we're thankful for it. But somehow when it comes to our own families, we think that's restrictive. Why should we have that? Our children need it. And in our experience, when we started living on regularity and schedule, we took care of half of our discipline issues. And over the last 26 years of ministry, we have seen family after family that when they deal with this, family worship falls into place. They start, they, they have more time for God. They have more time for family time. They have more time to talk as a couple because they're redeeming some time rather than living in chaos. 
Room to bloom. Oh, your relationships. Go ahead. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. I thought I just did a bunch of talking there. You so. did. <laughs> Relationships. Hannah talked about relationships in the context of family. Hannah and Caleb. Yes, Hannah and Caleb. That's right. It was Hannah and Caleb. They talked about relationships. And one of the things that we really picked up in that and really appreciated is the honesty with which we need to deal with these relationships. Amen. If we will be honest with ourselves, and sometimes that's hard when we're in relationships, and they talked about you know, the, the boyfriend, girlfriend thing and, you know, who you're getting to know and associate with. Sometimes it's hard to be honest and we say, oh, no, there's nothing there. We're just friends. Yeah, right. How come you text them, you know, 100 texts a day and all your other friends you text once a week? Something's a diff little different there. <laughs> so we, if we can't be honest with ourselves, which is really the best, it's good if we'll be honest with our parents. It's good if we'll be honest with our God, okay? That implies that we have a relationship with God and with our parents that helps facilitate the relationships that come into the family that might be a lifelong relationship. And if you don't have a relationship with God and a relationship with mom and dad, then you don't need to be in any relationship with anybody else. Well is that, said. Is that pretty basic? Because if you don't know how to get along in your family, you're certainly not going to be your real self in a relationship. And anything that will kill a relationship faster than anything is to be somebody you are not. So you need to be who you are, but learn who that person is and be happy with the person you are because you have the right relationship with God. Then you don't have to try to be somebody else. And you don't have to try or you don't have to impress. You just be yourself and be honest. And if you're honest with yourself and with God and your parents, then you have the greatest maturity to be in a relationship. And if they don't else. like you, the honest person who you are, better to find it out on this side of the wedding That's altar right. than the other side because you faked it. And I can't tell you how many people try to impress, to try to be what they think that other person, like the kind of phone they like, do the kind of things they like, now, there's a certain amount of that that's give and take. But when you try to change to give a certain impression, you're on dangerous ground. Mm -hmm. Be who you are. And if they don't like who you are, fine. God will bring you to the person who likes who you are who because love who you are. they'll love who you are. That's right. That's right. So why not? And then why not give our young people room to grow? Paul and Carolyn did bloom to gr room, room to, to bloom. bloom thank you i was putting it backwards here and basically the whole focus of that message was really our responsibility as parents when our children begin they are totally dependent upon us by the time we finish them our parenting and they are ready to launch into life they should be fully independent of us they don't need us for anything, although we still want them to be able to, to talk with us and things like that and bounce ideas, but they can function independently. They're mature enough to handle life independently. They have direction for life. They have a connection with God, and they are safe to launch into life. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility, parents, is not to, you know, just close our eyes and hope they hurry up and grow up or to micromanage them and have them under our thumb under every little thing, our responsibility is to take this totally dependent infant and make that transition with them through, through the power of God so that they can be successful as they head into life to live the life God has called them to live for him in service. And we talked this morning about probabilities. And we save probabilities to the end because it really gets involved with all the decisions we make individually right. as a married couple and as parents and children, youth, young people in the family, family dynamics. dynamics. You see, too many times we work off of probabilities when we don't even recognize we're working off of it. And what ends up happening is that we limit our possibilities based on how we've done in the past, okay? Instead of saying, with Christ, all things are possible. I'm pressing on toward the mark, 
toward the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. That implies looking onward and upward. Instead, we often, and we may not even consciously realize it, but we often refer to our past failures to decide whether we can be successful for the future. We can't do that. We can't do that and be successful because we have to forget those things that are behind and with Christ go forward, pressing on toward the mark, and he will give us the impossible victories. Amen. He will give us the insights, the wisdom, the discretion, the discernment, all the things that we need to become successful, whether it's in our individual life, in our marriages, in our families, as youth, being responsible, learning proper independence. All these things are not to be limited by our failure, but to be achieved by our forward looking with the possibilities of God. So what are we going to do? We've just capsulized, summarized the last four days. And what, the, the question is, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Are you gonna leave this camp, this retreat, the same as you came? Are you going to leave with, with choices to be determined to be all that God wants you to be? This is simply a choice, and that choice is ours. And we've made commitments, and that wasn't phony, by the way. That was real, because we both know this is an area we, we still have room to grow in. Absolutely. I still have Absolutely. a me. I still have a me that surfaces, and, and sometimes it's surprising to see it's some of the insignificant things that it may surface over. And I need help, because sometimes we don't see who we really are, but our spouse can see it. So give them permission. So what are we going to do? because there's no limits with God. So why not let God do all he wants to do for us? And so we want to encourage you tonight as we close. We want to encourage you that God isn't asking us to do everything before we leave. That's right. Or by the time we get home. God is only asking us to use our power of choice. That great power of choice that he's given to us to make the choice to say, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you ask me to do. I'm willing, and, and, and all of us have, have had thoughts brought to us, all of us have had convictions brought to us, all of us have had things that we weren't even looking for pop up in our minds, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. God isn't asking us to deal with all of it, he's asking for us to give him permission to deal with what he thinks is the first priority That's to deal right. with. He doesn't overwhelm us. Right. The Bible's full of examples. All he does is he wants to take us step by step. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. He just wants us to be surrendered to him and be willing to let him do in us and through us whatever he knows we need. One choice at a time. So he won't overwhelm us. In closing, I want to just read a beautiful couple of sentences here from inspiration, taken from volume two of Mind, Character, and Personality. Powerful volumes about dealing with the mind and emotions. Page 480, paragraph three. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. Isn't that beautiful? There is nothing in our experience that's too dark for God to see and understand and to read. Too ugly or it's too nothing, embarrassing. That's right, nothing too ugly or embarrassing. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. Amen. Whatever it is that God is asking us to do, all of us to do, he is well able and he will not ask us to do anything that he is not prepared to equip us to do. That's right. We can be rejoicing in that. And everything he asks of us is because of love. He loves us. He yearns 
for us to be with him for eternity. How shall we respond? 